Hey, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with Brian Barker, who is from Drew University, who's from Drew, who's from Drew University, Associate Professor of Biology, and a member of the uh, podcast This Week in Virology, which I talk about all the time. Every clinician, everybody needs to listen to this show. It's really great. So since we last spoke, which is a while ago now, did you get your vaccine? I did. Um, I have been fully vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, It was a little emotional after being someone who worked on nucleic acid vaccines to actually receive one. Um, And I am very, very pleased to have received it. I can imagine. I mean, I had nothing to do with vaccines when I got it. I felt like (laughs) this is like miraculous that this is happening. This has happened so fast. Right. We've been working on this technology for a decade and it's here and I'm getting it and I'm protected and what? Yeah, it's, it's been amazing. And then as things have happened, like my parents and some of my friends and my sister have been vaccinated, I sort of get to feel this joy over and over again uh, about triumph of science and, you know, maybe uh, some return to normalcy someday. Um, and it's, it's, it's a good feeling. Yeah, well, the post-vaccination data has been really impressive. We had the randomized trials that you and I talked about months ago that looked really good, extraordinarily good. Now we have real world data from places like Israel in particular, where just the uh, deaths, the hospital admissions just plummeted. This is a, Mm -hmm. a real miracle of modern science, right? Yes. No, I I am just, you know, so proud of the scientific community uh, for being able to pull this off. And I hope that um, everyone realizes just what a great accomplishment this was. But not all vaccines are made the same. So uh, these Pfizer and the Moderna, you explained to us, these are uh, mRNAs that are coated with some uh, nanoparticles of fat. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, um, we think that they're probably going to produce less immunogenic problems than J&J and AstraZeneca, which are in monkey coronavirus shells. Is that correct? So they are both... No, so both of them are in um, a type of virus called an adenovirus. Okay. Um, and so basically, um, adenoviruses are uh, a big group of viruses, some of which uh, can cause common colds. Um, and people have thought about using them to deliver DNA for a long time. Um, but they have always had a problem that you make a pretty strong immune response to adenovirus. So if you'd ever had adenovirus in your life, um, those vaccines might not work in you. Um, as a result, AstraZeneca used a chimpanzee adenovirus um, to make sure that people had never been uh, received that uh, virus before. And um, Johnson & Johnson used a rare type of adenovirus called AD26, which is a human adenovirus. Mm-hmm. Um, in both cases, the adenoviruses are pretty heavily uh, modified from a normal adenovirus, so they aren't able to actually reproduce on their own. You can almost think of them as using an adenovirus shell to deliver the nucleic acid instead of using a lipid shell. Um, the virus doesn't do much besides be a shell to protect the DNA uh, as it gets into cells. So you use viruses that we haven't been exposed to because otherwise, if you used a virus and stuck in new nucleic material that we've been exposed to all the time, you'd have an immune response and probably never get this thing to replicate. So you've got to use a monkey or you've got to use something really rare you're not exposed it, to. Exactly. So what you want to do is um, make sure that you don't already have antibodies against that um, virus shell so that the virus shell can do its job deliver the DNA into cells and induce an immune response um, without you having those pre-existing antibodies. Okay. So that brings us to uh, the fact that uh, where we are right now, which is AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson um, have some issues with uh, thrombosis. Mm-hmm. So uh, J&J is on a pause. AstraZeneca here in the United States is on a pause. I'm not sure how much they were going to deploy of AstraZeneca here in the US anyway. Right. But for... AstraZeneca, it looks like about one in a hundred thousand people will develop uh, heparin, I mean, not heparin, vaccine induced uh, thrombocytopenia, which is actually a pro thrombotic state, not a bleeding state. It's a pro thrombotic state, although mm-hmm. some of these patients have developed uh, c- cerebral venous thrombosis and then bled afterwards. So, about one in a hundred thousand for AstraZeneca and about one in a million for Johnson and Johnson. Is there any uh, vaccines that have had this issue in the past? Do we know the mechanism? It seems to be something about you were developing antibodies to a particular platelet protein or something. 
So we really don't know the mechanism. There haven't been um, situations where this has happened in the past. There are a couple of different theories for what's going on. Um, and I think that especially with the Johnson & Johnson, there still is a little bit of question about whether um, this is uh, vaccine mediated. Um, if you look at the occurrence of some of these issues in the general population um, compared to what's being seen, um, there, there's some debate <laughs> about what's mm -hmm. going on. Um, so if we uh, take that this may be associated with the vaccine, there are a couple of possible things happening. One of them is that perhaps there is induction of antibodies against a platelet activating factor um, that is leading to this. And that uh, data has actually just come out in the past couple of days, um, indicating that that antibody cross-reaction might happen. This is the first time that adenoviruses have ever been given um, in terms of vaccines to such a large number of people, um, but we're all infected with some adenoviruses in our lives. So it's a little odd that um, adenoviruses might be causing uh, that issue, given that we've all had some other type of adenovirus before. Well, it um, could actually explain why there is a baseline rate of cerebral venous thrombosis, for example. Sure. Though it's not usually associated with low platelet count. So, uh, and that's what you were saying, like the Johnson & Johnson, if it's true, it's su at such a low level, it's hard to work out if this, is it really more than just the baseline rate that occurs mm -hmm. out in the population? Uh, one right. One million it is really rare. Right. It's one in a million. Um, it seems like the six cases that they've seen with Johnson & Johnson are all in women in a specific age group. Mm -hmm. And so it may be slightly higher than one in a million if you start to just look at the vaccine recipients who are women in that age group, but it's still mm -hmm. exceedingly rare. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the other things that people have been talking about uh, with when this was just a problem with AstraZeneca is that Compared to Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer and Moderna, uh, AstraZeneca used a different version of the spike um, in their vaccine. And so mm -hmm. some people were wondering about whether this was related to that version of the spike. Um, and they also actually use a small piece of another uh, protein um, that's related to platelets in stabilizing the spike in the AstraZeneca vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Before the Johnson & Johnson um, information started, some people were pointing to um, either that spike form or that other modification as being um, question marks with AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. um, now that Johnson & Johnson has had potentially similar issues, um, there is more question about whether this is an adenovirus vector um, issue. But of course, none of this is yet proven. Um, and again, data in the past day or so has been about these antibodies against platelets. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong again, you are giving me a biology lesson here. S these immune reactions could be to the virus vector itself, some other proteins, or the, the mRNA, DNA, the spike that is being produced by those uh, vaccines. It could be right. both the coding or the stuff you put inside it. Exactly. And mm -hmm. one piece of evidence that says it might not be the uh, spike, the stuff they put inside, mm -hmm. is that we haven't seen these types of reactions with Pfizer and Moderna, mm -hmm. which also use nucleic acid um, that encodes the same version of spike that Johnson & Johnson is using. So... Um Again, we'll go through some more numbers later, but uh, it's very rare. Johnson & Johnson, to me, I think they will take off the pause. Um, there's lots of controversy about whether they even should have. They're being very, very cautious, um, and people could argue both ways. Um, but for the AstraZeneca, I think a pause is reasonable. And as you said, that perhaps what we're, they're doing is trolling the data to work out, is there a group in whom it's um, higher risk. So if I'm looking at the AstraZeneca uh, data from an Oxford study that I'll be quoting later, it does seem that if you're a young woman um, under the age of 30, that the risk of the vaccine or having a clot is just a little, almost the same as your risk of getting COVID um, and having a significant complication if there is almost no COVID out there. So if there's almost no COVID and you're a woman under the age of 30, uh, risk and benefit is very similar. As soon as there's more than a little bit of virus out there, or as soon as you're over the age of 30, it's even with AstraZeneca, which is the worst case scenario right now, it is absolutely in your favor to be vaccinated. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, these vaccines uh, still seem to ha- uh, win in a cost benefit ratio in terms of being very beneficial. And one thing that I have tried to stress to people about this Johnson and Johnson pause is that they should realize that this is the level of scrutiny that these vaccines are undergoing um, for safety signals. And so I'm hoping that this might make people feel sort of safe about the level of um, analysis that's happening on these vaccines to make sure that everything is okay. See, I agree with you on this. I think that uh, and being overly cautious and being vocal about it and being, you know, telling the public that, and then once they've looked at the data, then reintroducing it, I think is the right way to go to say there's nothing to see here. There's nothing to see here is exactly what people are worried about is that the government is going to hide any bad side effects from you. They're not hiding anything from us right now. Right, exactly. So the uh, most recent information that I uh, learned in our TWIV discussions yesterday, Mm -hmm. was that um, this complication, if it's happening in Johnson & Johnson, they think it's happening within the first two to three weeks following vaccination. And the final group of people who received the vaccine before the pause will hit that mark on the 25th. And so by the 25th, any of the cases of these complications that might have uh, happened will have happened and they should have a decent data set to really look at. You are so, it's so great to have you on here. That's a piece of information we would never have found out otherwise than you guys that do that show. Yeah. So, so I'm quoting a conversation from TWIB. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I may have something slightly off, but that was the, the general information we talked about. Okay. Yeah. That would make a lot of sense because, you know, obviously the FDA uh, has a significant amount more data than we have. And um, that pause makes sense. It gives you that lead time. It does appear to be about from five days to 16 days, these things are occurring. So if they're waiting that amount of time, that makes a lot of sense to me to be able to collect that data and even see with Johnson & Johnson, is it really above the baseline rate? Exactly. Or is it so insignificantly above us to be basically the baseline rate? Right. Fantastic information. Thank you very much. Are there any other types of vaccines that we're going to see soon, the ones where they basically just inject you with the spike protein or uh, uh, are they coming soon? So there is a vaccine that is a subunit vaccine, exactly as you described, where they just inject the, the spike protein um, made by Novavax and their uh, phase three is wrapping up um, and they should be going for emergency use author- excuse me, emergency use authorization um, very soon. Um, I think that we can expect to see that sort of any time now. Mm-hmm. Do we have the phase three data on Novavax yet? Um, I've sort of heard some rumors and seen bits and <laughs> heard bits and pieces of it, but I don't think that the full uh, data is released. Usually the full data um, is released in a packet uh, a week before the FDA meeting um, mm-hmm. where you can find it in that FDA packet online. You're right. I think they did a press release, but it, yeah, it was lacking in uh, lots of detail. Okay, exactly. so we'll be looking for that. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for your time again. Um, you've become the rock star for emergency positions <laughs> across the world. Well, thank you. Uh, it's very flattering. <laughs> Yeah, we've found that on not only do uh, the emergency physicians have to go work in the ERs, but as all clinicians are and all biologists right now, we're all part of this discussion and need to know these facts because people, friends, family, uh, news organizations are asking us. So the more you educate us, the more we can educate other people. So again, thank you for your time. No problem. I was happy to help out. So I said I'd go into this in a bit more detail. So this is the Winton Center for Risk and Evidence Communication. And this is about AstraZeneca, the risk of clot, and the risk of going to the ICU, um, depending on the level of virus in the community. So I really like the way they did this, because it's not enough to just say, well, your risk of clot is X, and uh, your risk of COVID is Y. You've got to be more sophisticated than that, and this group has done that. So... Let's look at what they've done here. So this is for 100,000 people at low risk of developing COVID, and they defined low risk as about two cases per 10,000 per day, which was roughly the UK last month. You know, they've come out of that big surge they had there, dipping down like places like California. So in that case, again, for the AstraZeneca, which is, you know, 10 times more likely to produce uh, this clot and this heparin-induced or vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and cerebral venous thrombosis, that if you're in that age group that's under the age of 30, then it's right on the edge about whether uh, the risk reduction is worth it because, you know, it's about the same. As soon as you get over the age of 30, it really starts to favor getting the vaccine, even in these low prevalence 
of getting the disease situations. And then, of course, when you get into the higher age groups, it's not even close because your chance of clot goes down in those age group and your chance of ending up in the ICU goes way up. And we should also say, if you go to the ICU, your chance of coming out of the ICU is not great. And your chance of developing a, a thrombus is a very, very high, like, you know, 40%. It's all over the place, but it could be that high. Now, here is a medium risk exposure. And so they're defining this as six um, cases of COVID per 10,000 per day. And as soon as you get into this medium group, it favors the vaccine every time. And certainly as you get older, I mean, it's just not even close. And then if you're in a high risk group, and this is defined as 20 cases per um, 10,000 people per day, again, not even close. Again, this is pretty sophisticated. Now, you could sort of divide this out even more, and people are doing that, and the FDA and other people are doing that right now. That's why we've got some pauses on these. So now let's divide out by uh, gender, for example. Women appear to be getting more clots, um, underlying medical conditions. And what you could do then is probably define some groups where it is extraordinarily safe to do this, and maybe some groups where you shouldn't be doing it if it's a low-risk population, you don't have much virus out there, you're a woman, you're on OCPs, whatever, smoker, um, whatever it turns out to be the risk factors, you would say, okay, that group shouldn't get the AstraZeneca. But let me say again, this is for AstraZeneca, the J&J, which was put on a pause, has one-tenth the risk of clotting that this has. So I have almost no doubt that J&J will be unpaused after they look at that data. And... Um, if you did this kind of analysis, and people are, you would see that there'd be a tiny little risk from um, the, the vaccination and uh, all of this risk would stay the same. So this could all drop in theory by a factor of 10, making J&J &J basically safe for everybody.